Um, great. So we're um, reserving about 10 minutes at the end uh, for any of you who would like to ask either of us any question. And in the meantime, I feel like um, a student who has done some <laughs> homework uh, on things he chats with Sumit. So uh, welcome, Sumit. Really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I like the setting, small intimate room. Feel free to ask me things afterwards as well. Um, so I think the way I kind of structure this in my mind is maybe a little into that personal introduction because I personally went to YouTube and watched a couple of videos of people talking with you and I find it really interesting, you know, to go back and f figure out how you became to become, you know, you know, in, in, into the position you're in today. Uh, and then we move into kind of an introduction about, you know, what's PyTorch, uh, how it differentiates itself from other AI platforms. Um, where what are the gaps that it fills that others don't, and then move into the, the PyTorch Foundation and, and, and so on. Uh, so um, maybe we start with a quick introduction about yourself, your history, education, how you got involved, and, and so on. Sure, sounds good. I'm I'm Sumit. I'm 34 years old. I'm from India, where I grew up most of my time, and I. I went to a college that did not have all the things I wanted to learn. So I went on to the internet and that's how I also ended up going uh, and getting involved into the open source movement because it's it's really great um, for, for me at that time to learn a lot of things, have a lot of m people guiding and mentoring as you navigate things that you want to learn. And that's, that's, uh, that was me most, like most of my undergrad. Um, and then I, I went to CMU for a year to figure out what to do with my life. Uh, did a little bit more exploration around AI, then came to NYU for grad school, got a lot more involved in open source. Uh, when I was at NYU, both in the Torch project, uh, another project called EB Learn, and while doing my internship at Siemens, also getting very involved with the PCL, the point clouds library, um, that is more related to AI and robotics, I guess it's just robotics. And eventually I started getting way more involved with Torch to a point where I was the person spending the most amount of time reviewing patches, sending in issues, PRs. And then at some point I got very annoyed with the Torch maintainers at that time that they were not responding to my PRs and reviewing them in time. And so I wrote, wrote them an email and they said, hey, we got busy with our lives. Why don't you take over the maintainership? That was the start of my officially becoming a maintainer of a large project. I got my job uh, at Meta uh, because I was a Torch maintainer and Meta was using Torch at that time. Eventually, we needed to write a new version of Torch and a bunch of people within the Torch community, we got together, decided how to design it and then created PyTorch. And um, we did not think it would get as big as it got. We were hoping to just be those small set of 20 people just hacking night and day doing things, but it got big and um, I'm trying to lead the whole thing to reflect the values of the community and at the same time coordinate among multiple stakeholders, um, getting the funding that the project needs, the resources, and that's pretty much what the role I play today. I'm also a an AI researcher just in general. I publish a lot and that's 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 my introduction. Awesome. Uh, so I think one of the very interesting things about the PyTorch project, and I mentioned this earlier in my uh, you know ten minutes this morning, is the amazing job Meta did in growing the community to become today, you know, 2,400 active contributors, you know, thousands of projects rely on PyTorch as a, 
uh, requirement for their work and you know all, you know all, all that work and uh, it would be really nice to share some of the lessons learned from that experience in you know what are the things that worked really well in building a community really starting from a handful of internal developers to thousands and thousands of developer and then also you know hundreds of thousands of uh, installations and, and, and um, uh, adoption. Sure. Um, PyTorch is a product first and then an open source project. It's, it wasn't created with being like we are open source at all costs and the product thing comes as a second priority. So, so we, we, we created something that deeply understood the users we were serving and we wanted them to have the best experience possible and that that has an that has been our goal we we strongly rely, rely on feedback loops we get from customers and users and we constantly iterate on this aspect and make sure things that are as simple as good error messages or like durable APIs are, are things we uphold. Um, that's how we started. That's pretty much our only guiding principle. Be pragmatic, focus on our customers, make sure they are having a good experience. Everything else effectively is secondary. Um, for example, we, we link with some uh, some closed source libraries in our default binaries because that's just what users want. So we, we link with Intel MKL, we link with NVIDIA CUDA, and we're not open source peers, we're just pragmatic to what the users need. I think that is one, I wouldn't say a lesson or anything, it's just an opinion that we carry that has worked well. So that's just something for you to take home on that it worked well. It's not good or bad or right or wrong, it's just what we do. Um, secondly, we spend a lot of time building and fostering a community that is positive and productive. We really try to foster speed of development and a good a good forum for people and we spend a lot of time answering questions on the forum. I think we we have something like a hundred thousand questions answered with I mean with the number of replies if you count I think it goes into like even more um, just between the PyTorch core developers and a lot of our contributors were people who actually asked questions and then eventually liked the 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 vibe we give and slowly started contributing something small and over time felt empowered to to do more and that uh, incremental um, onboarding uh, that is more organic where people can come in do what they want and if they feel like they can do something more, they do it, and we encourage them to and, and respond to them positively. That, that has worked well. I think that's a function of any open source project. We, I don't think, are unique over there. But that initial effort we put in making this happen is generally not easy. I, I think I wrote a blog post about this, which was a transcript at Julia giving a keynote, uh, which was like, in the initial days of PyTorch, I was reading through 500 plus notifications a day and wow. actually responding to most of them, um, which is a lot of energy and time. And so when you start an open source project, some of the most pathological failures you have is if your project gets too big, you don't figure out how to structure the scaling part. You just like give up, you start responding, you just hope that people would go away and you just want it to be a small project and you just want like to live in the bubble of the five people who are using your project. And that's generally great. I would prefer, 
<laughs> PyTorch being much smaller than it is, but uh, at the same time, uh, we've set up these processes to scale it up, um, triaging, prioritizing. At some point, we recognized, uh, I think this was a year and a half in or two years in, that we simply physically could not, doesn't matter the size of our team, we could not get our GitHub issues to zero. That's just the reality. Like at some point we were trying, we were like, oh, we're at 150 issues, come on, let's do a sprint, let's get it down to 70, and then we'll do another sprint. Like we wanna get it to zero. And then the issues started growing faster than our community. Like, I mean, that's just the reality. And when we embraced that, we embraced prioritization. We said, look, we cannot do everything for everyone. Uh, we have to prioritize. And I think that's one of the important things that we did when we were scaling the project. That's roughly like, I think the two or three things I could mm -hmm. think of that, that really set the tone for PyTorch. Um, I think one thing you said at the beginning was kind of product versus open source is extremely interesting. And I actually had a discussion this morning with the CEO of an AI company where, and as part of LFA and data, we have multiple startups and they're always struggling as, you know, they're building an open source project on which they will build a product. And there's always this challenge of, you know, should we prioritize a product first and open source as kind of a side effect second or focus on building the community of the open source project and then transfer and, and deviate to, to a product there. Uh, so this is kind of an ongoing challenge with every single company that is in such a situation. Um, and um, as a general note on the maintainer uh, effort, uh, maintainers are like the unsung heroes <laughs> of open source. We're actually doing a series at the LF uh, featuring 25 maintainers of large projects, um, you know, these folks have to write their own code. They're responsible for, you know, the certain functionality within projects and they have to review other people's code and approve. It's just an insane amount of work. Um, so from the LF to, to a maintainer representing all maintainers, you know, thank you very much for all that hours. Um, so when we look at the AI ecosystem, there are a number of other uh, AI frameworks. Um, you know, there's a couple that are pretty famous and there are also a few of them that are mostly focused uh, and highly adopted in a given geography. Um, so what sets PyTorch um, apart from, you know, the other AI frameworks in general? And in a sense, what are the gaps it fills that others don't? And kind of at the same time, there's this massive appeal for using PyTorch in academia, which all of these together came in and kind of contributed to the success of PyTorch. If you're able to touch on um, you know, these things for the audience, please. Yeah, so when we started PyTorch, there were 15 deep learning frameworks. We were not the only one. Um, what I said earlier is basically what our philosophy and strategy has been, which is be highly malleable to what users want. And that's what we try to bring to the table. We try to understand what users want very intimately. So generally when you have a project or a product, um, you can have two failure modes. Uh, one is you think users want something and then you build it and it turns out users don't want that and you never knew. And the second is you think users want something and that is true, but while building it, you didn't build it well, like you, you didn't execute well. So generally, if we think about these two parts, with PyTorch, what differentiates us from some of the other products is we focus way too much on our feedback loops. We want to hear from every student and scientist and engineer, and we want to make sure, regardless of how much money they bring in, how much potential they have as commercialization, how large their company is, you want to hear from all stakeholders and then prioritize. I think that is something that we could do 
tanks to how we set up our 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 resourcing. Like initially, Meta funded a lot of uh, PyTorch development, and over time, Nvidia built up a team, and Microsoft built up a team, but nowhere we, did we compromise on oh yeah like if you build a team of devs here we will prioritize feature development for stuff that you want like we basically said hey we're okay if you don't build any devs but if you build devs with the right mindset we will happily accept them so like like i think we've established that all stakeholders here are important and I think that's something that you don't see always from some of our competitors because they might have more direct commercial interests in monetizing the product and that conflicts with the larger customer maybe having a bigger say and things like that. So, for example, capturing the researcher market, I believe, is a direct result of that prioritizing that feedback loop way more than it would deserve if you treated it as a commercial revenue stream. Yeah, and um, you know, one of my friends once told me ab about this kind of aspect of managing projects is that's the difference between control and leadership, where when a company is hosting, created a project, they often try to control it. And he gave me the example of squeezing on sand, where you, if you squeeze on sand, the sand will start coming down between in between your fingers whereas leadership you know you set certain principles that you want the project to run by and as long as everything playing by playing by these principles you drive through and you continue and you know PyTorch community has four different principles maybe you can share them with the you know the focus on R&D the openness and feedback and there's one more I guess um, I, I honestly don't remember yeah, so the, the, co the core four principles uh, because I remember reading the documentation we have, uh, and it's um, it's really um, important, you know, where a company wants to control a project versus become a leader for it and invite everybody else and be open about the criteria of how things should work, and then let the community basically work within these uh, different parameters. So now we're kind of transitioning the project to the foundation, and. Uh, in LFAI and data, just as an example, we have uh, 41 hosted projects. And there are maybe four or five reasons that apply to these different projects on why uh, their organizations decided to move to a foundation and host the project there. Uh, so it would be really interesting to see kind of from a Facebook slash meta perspective uh, if we're, you're able to share an insight of the drivers and motivations for Meta and its partner to decide, hey, you know, let's uh, figure a way to move and transition the project to a foundation and launch it as kind of um, with, from within a foundation. Sure. Um, it's very strategically important for Meta, for PyTorch to grow because they use PyTorch and the more resources get pulled into PyTorch, uh, the, the better it is for them. So PyTorch is powering all of Meta's AI workloads internally across board from servers to edge to pretty much everything. So one of the, I mean, the, the basic strategy here is do you want a large piece of a small pie or do you want a small piece of a large pie where the small piece might actually be bigger? than the large piece of the small pie. Um, and over the years, we have seen um, a lot of partners participate in PyTorch from, from NVIDIA to Microsoft to AMD to um, Google um, to um, um, I'm blanking on to AWS, who are our launch partners. Um, who have actually done several projects and uh, features within the PyTorch ecosystem uh, from integration into uh, various hardware backends to cloud uh, integrations to uh, actually starting first-party projects within PyTorch, such as TorchServe and PyTorch XLA. 
um, there's been lots of investments into PyTorch. And one of the things that people, you know, when we go and say, hey, what would it take for you to invest more into PyTorch? They're just like, well, like PyTorch is a meta project. Um, it, we don't feel like we have any say. Like regardless of like, I mean, it's this is the difference between going and talking to the engineers who are contributing versus going and talking to the CTO, right? The engineers contributing are like, this is great. Like all my PRs are reviewed on time. I actually even got commit rights to a bunch of modules, whatever. Like, I don't care like what the governing entity structure is like. But then you go talk to the CTO and say, can you fund like a larger team here? They say, I need to fulfill my fiduciary duties and like think about this more from like a, a, a govern like a proper governance perspective, right? So it was obvious to us that if we moved it to a neutral foundation structure, give all the big stakeholders um, they like say in the commercial interests of PyTorch, then it would just be a healthy thing for more stakeholders to grow their involvement in PyTorch, with knowing that uh, at the executive level that that the governance is actually neutral and it's like and it's not just being said so. Uh, that was that was a big the the big reason uh, for why like why it made total sense. By the way, this is not just the foundation wasn't even the first step in doing this. Like all the work here has been happening for years. Where um, we started as a community project, and then we needed to figure out as a project how to structure ourselves properly. Everything was um, ad hoc. <laughs> Uh, we were like, I think some of the GitHub organization stuff was just on my personal credit card. And like, we were just like all over the place. <laughs> so Meta actually put some structure, filed some trademarks, did all that. And then once that was done, we were the, our next step was always planned to be, okay, then now it is properly governed and structured, we'll move it to a foundation. And then we were looking at, huh, who should we work with to move to a foundation? And honestly, it wasn't even that big of a, an argument. We just were like, the Linux Foundation is great. I think Kubernetes had a good time. Um, it's, I think we, we didn't spend a lot of time. We reached out and it set up. That's like the whole context here. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually a pretty similar um, situation to a lot of the project that moved to the foundation where uh, the founder of the project gets kind of market demand in the sense that we would love to invest and adopt the project, but we'd feel a lot more comfortable and um, very low risk, if you wish, if the project is hosted in a foundation and has an open uh, neutral governance that will allow us, based on our investment and resources, to gain certain uh, maintainer or committer positions in, in the project, you know, based on contributions. And that helps the project uh, grow even more. So the point about, you know, a small piece of the pie, but the pie is really big, is actually on point with a lot of our experiences. I just want to clarify one thing here. Um, the PyTorch Foundation was started explicitly for business governance and if you're a large company and you say, oh, like I am donating, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a member and I want to fund a million dollars into the project, uh, you, can, you have no power to ask for committer rights. The technical governance is entirely separate and it's a hierarchical structure similar to say the Linux project and stuff. So we thought it was very important to protect the long-term health of the project to give maintainer status to individuals based on contributions and merit um, rather than to give it to companies on a pay-for-play pay basis. And I think, just wanted to clarify that, so the business uh, governance moves to the foundation and that is very important because outside of committer status, there's a million things that a project needs to thrive. and. 
uh, you, you just don't want the whole pay to play and then vendor, the largest vendor just pays the most amount of money and gets the most amount of maintainers and you don't want that. So that's something we've done. Yeah, correct. And um, in fact, this mirrors um, all the foundations or umbrella foundations under the Linux Foundation where we have uh, a very clear separation between the governance of the foundation itself and the governance of projects. So every project have their own technical governance completely managed by its maintainers. And the foundation is really the funding aspect where you know the project needs to pay for its IT infrastructure, for uh, license uh, compliance scanning, for trademark management. This can get pretty expensive. Uh, for marketing, for booth at events, for creative work, etc., etc., and this is where the membership fees from whether it's PyTorch Foundation or any other foundation gets channeled into, and especially if there are dedicated staff. So when you have dedicated staff, also you need additional budget, and so on. So um, definitely the point that the technical governance is completely separated, and you can be a trillion dollar company, you will have one vote and zero influence on the technical project, uh, regardless. Um, so how do you see Meta's involvement now with the launch of the PyTorch Foundation, you know, looking into the future? Yeah, so Meta plans to only increase its investments into PyTorch, into the number of developers and the, the kind of resources it powers uh, into PyTorch. Um, we started the foundation with the hope of grabbing uh, the benefits of a larger and larger ecosystem as PyTorch scales. And I, you, you've seen how Meta has been involved within PyTorch in the past, and it's the same mental model pretty much. We're, we're going to be very closely involved. A large part of the maintainers currently are Meta employees. They weren't to begin with, actually. <laughs> Over time, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the maintainers ended up just coming and working in the PyTorch team at Meta. Um, and we're going to continue to invest in, in talent and resources, pretty much. And uh, I'm curious about kind of the sentiment within Meta. Like, we've been monitoring the sentiment on the internet, you know, on social media and so on, and it's been mostly positive or neutral. Uh, but I wonder from Meta engineering perspective, you know, when the teams using PyTorch and co-creating it, you know, with others got the news that, hey, this is moving, you know, how was the reception to that news? I think in practice, the PyTorch, PyTorch inside Meta was managed very closely to how it would be within a foundation anyways. Like the PyTorch team really enforced the maintainership model. And if someone sent a random commit from Meta, some other team at Meta sent a commit into the PyTorch code base, we really scrutinize it and all of that. So I think this wasn't a surprise to a lot of people. I think a lot of people had questions around what it means for them. Does like the common misconception is like, oh yeah, Meta is dumping PyTorch into a foundation yeah. or whatever. Like, and I think like when you hear, when you read the headlines and scroll past it uh, and you are, you just take the headline for its face value, you have a bunch of these questions. So we spent some time clarifying exactly what this means at a more granular level. But apart from that kind of clarification and fixing, um, um, the detailing that people did not get into, it was universally positive. Like, uh, because I think, as I said, this is how the mental model is internally at the company on how we develop with PyTorch and how we use PyTorch internally. So it wasn't really a big surprise or a shock to people or no one really said, oh, like, how can you do that or anything like that? It was pretty cool. natural. I think it, it also goes to the roots of Facebook and, you know, later on Meta, the fact that, you know, the company was built on open source and it's like it is in the uh, NDA of everybody, right? So unlike older company that started with proprietary technology is Facebook started with Linux and with the Apache and, you know, the LAMP stack and built from there. Um, so it is kind of an open source company. And what's really interesting is, you know, when you look at Facebook or Meta, 
today, you know, there is an open source program office and people tell me, oh, it's very small, it's like four or five people. I said, yes, but the whole company is an open source company, you know, instead of having like a large OSPO, uh, so on. Yeah, so I think um, like other large tech companies or at least some other large tech companies, I think uh, Meta, and Google and others, they probably don't see open, like the, the tooling that they build as their competitive advantage. So it's pretty natural in the DNA of many of these companies to think of tooling as um, not the thing that they want to control and lock down and commercialize and stuff like that. So I, I, I think Meta has an exceptional open source program uh, React and PyTorch uh, uh, and many many other projects HHVM they they all have like, have a lot, a lot of either origins or like a lot of resources being put in from Meta. Yeah, and um, I think for this, uh, do we have a time check? Um, six. Thank you. So I think um, from. From a technical perspective, nothing changing. You know, the project continues to be co-developed by its community. Uh, there is no breakdown of any of the workflows. Everything continues as is. So now, if I'm an end user, I mean, I don't have an expertise. I don't contribute to the project. Um, you know, I'm just I pull the code, and it's a dependency for me. Um, so from that perspective, what would be the message to bring in new users of PyTorch? Because I feel now there's even more ammunition in terms of, hey, the project is moving to a foundation. Um, so you will have as an end user kind of even more reasons to be uh, more trusting of the project and its future. I think um, most end users don't care. Um, I think this is more related to development of the project, but users, think of users as consumers. Like you have a, no one, I, I think, a very, 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 very small percentage of end users in the world today would choose an iPhone or an Android based on whether, like, how, how they are governed or controlled or something like that. Um, they, there, there is a percentage of end users who care about that, but it's very small. So most end users of PyTorch just want the best product. They don't really care around, like, how it's governed and all that. They're like, oh, if it's useful, if I'm able to use it today, great. Oh, it started not being very good. Okay, I'm going to see what other options are. That's just the mental model for people. Mm -hmm. So our users are very, very consumer-like. They, they don't really think about anything beyond the utility of the product. Uh, of course, this is the large part of our users, and there are some parts of users who do think about, oh, who's funding it, what is the model, and all of that. And those users, I think, will have a little more um, um, positive effect now that it's a neutral thing and it, they feel like it will have yeah. a long-term story regardless of which company funds or doesn't fund it. So those users can be kept at peace, but I think they're a very small percentage of users. Okay. And I think for the sake of time, I still probably have a couple questions and then we're going to open it, the questions for the audience here. Um, so like any other large project, it might be intimidating for new developers to jump in. There are a lot of different pieces, a massive amount of documentation, which you, you guys have done an amazing job on that. So if you are to give an advice for someone um, who's interested to start looking into PyTorch, learning it and contributing it, you know, what would you tell them where to start and what to look for? We have a contributing guide and we have issues that we mark as good first issue. Um, actually, I would say first uh, be a user of PyTorch. If you're, if you're using it, that itself is a great amount of contribution because then you're going to build something on top of it and publish it into your own GitHub channel, and then you will see users uh, use it. And there will be like uh, the, the ecosystem of PyTorch itself will expand. That I think is a first line of 
how you can contribute to PyTorch. Then comes like, well, I want to go fix something or I want to just go help with the core project. I mean, that's where like next level is like, come into the forum, start maybe answering a few questions from other people. If you feel like you know PyTorch well enough and you can help other people come, reply, answer. I think that's the next level of being able to contribute to the community. And then at some point, if you feel like, oh, now I think I have this idea I want to propose and maybe implement, or I want to fix this bug that I found, then that's like the third level. That's when you can actually come start seeing our contributing guide and figure out exactly how to send the PRs that uh, are in a way that we like, or you just want to contribute um, a patch uh, but you don't have a particular idea in mind, you can come look at our good first issue, tagged issues, and then take a crack at some of those. So that's roughly, I think, the structure of contributions I would layer. And I, I have to say, you know, I spent some time looking at the available resources, and it's really impressive. Just um, there are um, some open source projects like, like PyTorch where they've invested really a lot of efforts and resources into uh, providing a lot of documentation and, and guidelines for new contributors. So no wonder that you know when people come in, they don't feel like at loss completely on what to do and where to start. Um, so looking forward into the future, maybe you can share one or two kind of big things coming up in the pipeline um, from a kind of development perspective. This is kind of a major milestone now, the PyTorch Foundation. So what would, what do you think the next major milestone is going to be? We are working on a lot of things that I think will st substantiate into something big over the next few months to a year. Um, making us more competitive, making us, uh, from a product view, just making us um, catching us up to where we should be. I mean, we're always catching up to what users want, but I, I, I think there's some upcoming um, work that I'm really excited about uh, around PyTorch and compilers and PyTorch and hardware. Um, I think this form isn't uh, interested in the level of detail I want to yeah. get into, but largely I think there's a lot of good stuff coming out in the future. Awesome. So um, I think we're up to time. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, we have reserved a few minutes for any questions that uh, anyone in the room would like to address uh, to submit. Um, Go ahead. Okay. I'll tell you how we think about PyTorch itself fostering first party integrations or libraries or projects or things like that. The way we think about it is we say, we look at a particular area where PyTorch uh, doesn't have an option that users are asking for. Um, we look at that area and we say, okay, is anyone else filling this gap? And if the answer is yes, 
and they're they're doing a good job in filling that gap. We're like, this is great. I mean, we don't see PyTorch having a not invented here syndrome. We're just like, if someone else is filling this gap and they're doing a good job and all our users are happy, this is great. There's no reason for us to go in and bully multiple projects out saying, oh, but this is the first party support um, or your only third party support or something. Like that. We, we don't have any interest or plans to do that. We actually feel very much as part of the Python data ecosystem where we're just one project among many. Where there are gaps in user experience, users are asking for something, we wait a few months, we see no one filling those gaps. Then we try to design something within the PyTorch remit and we say, hey, like no one has been filling this gap and here is our solution. I think that model of not touching things that are working well um, and only king making where no one is filling the gap, that, that has worked well. I think it's what ultimately users want and it's also the right thing for the other stakeholders. If you're building a huge amount of energy into building a pipelining system or something, uh, and several people are, like it's not just one option, there's like 10 options for pipelining or PyTorch, right? You don't want us to come in and say, oh yeah, you spent the last two years putting all this energy into your project, but screw you, we're gonna be um, building a first party integration. That's not what we want. So that's how we think about it. So if someone is doing that already, great. Um, I, I don't see any reason why we should yeah. stop that. And then I think, I don't think it makes sense bringing it into, like I don't, I don't particularly understand actually what it would buy us to bring one of the 10 projects into the official foundation or uh, give them the official branding or something. That's also unfair to the other nine. Where we do try to step in is when 10 projects are serving a particular area, but then two years later, it's just two. And then we say, you two just merge and then we'll just make it one and then call it the official thing. We, we have done it once or twice. So that part we don't mind, but it has to be organic. We don't want to be top down saying this is the official thing without respecting the others. Uh, yeah, first. I think uh, that is going to be realized organically. The PyTorch Foundation wants to foster development in AI in general. PyTorch is obviously going to be the, the starting point. Um, will PyTorch Foundation become a CNCF or a NumFocus or something like that? I think it's something that we really need to figure out organically over time. I don't have a good answer. like. It, it really depends on what people are asking for, if there's a clear need. Like for example, I think uh, with CNCF and Kubernetes and stuff, like uh, there was probably a need for such a fostering foundation in the community and there wasn't anything else there. And so a lot of people were asking for it and it made sense and so I think if PyTorch Foundation is the only foundation around that is trying to serve this purpose, um, and over time it's doing the best job at understanding the needs of the projects and developers, and they want to come be under it, I think that's something that will resolve over time. Right now, I don't think it's exclusively doing that. So for example, NumFocus is a great, great place for a lot of ML and data science projects to go into. Um, there's a couple of other options. So uh, I think we'll figure this out over time.
I wrote this a um, few months ago, high cost launch in the high cost app um, for the mobile devices. And Google also has a lot of investments into pushing uh, TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow Lite for mo mobile devices, putting part of the Android version too. So how do you foresee PyTorch in terms of being a part of uh, PyTorch uh, Foundation? Uh, is it going to be more investment pushing into the mo mobile area, or is it going to be less? I mean, what, what, what is your thought? We will have a bigger update on mobile sometime early to mid next year, okay. but uh, we're 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 doing a lot of investments into PyTorch and Edge. N none of those are toning down or anything like that. Um, I think the foundation actually has a big role to play here because one of the things that has been holding uh, us back is the company, the vendors, right? Like mobile is dominated by a, a long tail vendor problem. You have a hundred vendors serving edge uh, and they all have their own interests and agenda and even heterogeneity in terms of hardware. Um, and they, I think are very happy with us moving to a foundation and they wanna work much more closely with PyTorch. Um, I, th I think, and I, I, I can, say this pretty plainly, and I think that actually contrasts um, Google with TensorFlow where they do want to control TensorFlow as a centralized brand. So I think all the vendors who are looking for a more neutral place to try to integrate and all that, they do have a good home here. As of earlier this week, it is the Linux Foundation, right? Yeah, so we, we are uh, in transit in terms of trademark and project assets, and all of the assets of the projects uh, are in transit or transition for the Linux Foundation. So it, it is either today or it was already that the Linux Foundation is the owner. And um, will this also include patents that Meta currently owns? I'm sorry. Okay. And will this also include patents that Meta currently includes on specific uh, algorithms or workflow that are implemented in Python? So I will defer to Scott. So, <laughs> so project operating under open source licenses and, and contributions are made under the terms of open source licenses. Um, so I would refer directly to the licensing document. Okay, but if the DC goes from the implicit uh, patent then, but okay, maybe this includes the people who are using it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and that. The transfer or the transition also include all project accounts, websites, you know, all project assets as well. Mm -hmm. Similar to any other project transferring uh, into the LF. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? All right, I think we're gonna call this session. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you, uh, Summit.